does the number two exist somewhere? That is, does two exist as an actual entity of some sort in some other realm? How about pi or two thirds or the square root of three? Do they exist as well? How about the concept of the square root? Does that exist? Do any of these mathematical objects actually exist? And if they do, how do you know? And in what form do they exist? Are they physical, non-physical, supernatural, spiritual, perhaps, or just merely an abstract, formless concept? Questions like these were asked thousands of years ago by Plato and his followers. They believed that these abstract mathematical entities actually exist in a non-physical realm somewhere, a sort of metaphysical space where they have an objective existence. Today, this view, the view that abstract mathematical objects exist independently of the human mind and the physical world is known as mathematical Platonism or mathematical realism. It says that mathematical objects are not invented by humans, but discovered actually, similar to how explorers might find new lands, let's say. They are abstract, eternal, and unchanging. For example, the fact that two plus two equals four is eternally true, no matter what, regardless of whether humans are around to observe or understand them. They do not depend on the physical universe or any observer's cognition. The number two, pi, a circle, all these mathematical or geometric forms actually exist and they're somewhere in some unseen non-physical realm. We don't create the number two or the concept of a circle. They exist already as perfect abstract forms that we come to know through mathematical reasoning. They're somewhere in some ethereal dimension, maybe. For example, let's say you have two red apples in front of you. Now, while these apples are distinct objects, they both share a certain property. They exist as a pair, or in terms of mathematics, they share the concept of two-ness. This two-ness isn't something inherent in the apples themselves, but represents an abstract idea that goes beyond their physical form. The apples are simply physical examples of this abstract concept of the number two. Additionally, they share the concept of redness, and their redness is just a physical example of the abstract concept of the color red. So the color red actually exists in some unseen metaphysical realm as well, according to Platonism. This is an example of Plato's theory of universals, which is a part of his larger theory of forms. Universals are abstract, non-physical entities or concepts that multiple particular objects can share. They're like the general properties of an object, let's say, and they exist independently of the objects that instantiate them. So in the case of the apples, two-ness is a universal that applies to any collection of two objects, whether apples, books, or anything else. Now enter Aristotle. Aristotle's realism, which we've come to call moderate realism, takes a slightly different stance. Aristotle agreed with Plato that universals, that is general properties or types, exist, but he rejected Plato's notion of a separate non-material realm where these universals reside. Instead, Aristotle argued that universals exist within the physical world, but are instantiated in particular things. For example, the concept of triangularity exists, but only through the specific triangular objects we encounter in the material world. And the concept triangle is merely an abstraction of it. As another example, take the circle. If I draw a circle freehand on a piece of paper, it won't be a perfect circle as you might know from your own experience. But the concept is there, inherent in my drawing. And that concept is the perfect circle I'm trying to imitate. My drawing is merely my attempt at drawing the universal circle. For Aristotle, universals exist only insofar as they are instantiated in particular objects, which makes his view more grounded in the physical world compared to Plato's. So in the context of mathematics, Aristotle's view would mean that mathematical entities do not exist in a separate realm, but are abstract properties that exist within the object we observe in the physical world. A triangle, for example, exists as a form within physical triangular objects rather than in a separate realm of abstract forms. So while Platonism claims that mathematical entities exist in a separate, non-physical, intangible realm, 
Aristotelian realism asserts that these entities only exist when instantiated in particular objects. Platonism is a more extreme form of realism, as you can probably tell, seeing mathematics as a realm of abstract entities entirely independent of our physical reality, while Aristotle's moderate realism ties these abstractions back to the real world. Fast forward to the 20th century and we're still debating the existence or ontology of mathematical objects. Two prominent figures in this discussion are W.V.O. Quine and Hilary Putnam, who both played major roles in shaping contemporary philosophy of mathematics. In particular, they came up with, perhaps, one of the most influential contemporary arguments in favor of mathematical realism, the Quine-Putnam indispensability argument. And they argue for why we should believe in the existence of these mathematical entities, but bear in mind their argument isn't along the lines of Plato where these abstract objects actually exist in some other unseen strange realm. Quine and Putnam's realism were more along the lines of Aristotle's moderate realism. Neither here nor there, we can break down the Quine-Putnam argument into two main premises. Premise one, we ought to have ontological commitment to all and only the entities that are indispensable to our best scientific theories. In this context, ontological commitment refers to a philosophical obligation to acknowledge the existence of certain things if they are fundamental to a theory that explains how the world works. Premise two, mathematical entities are indispensable to our best scientific theories. Physics heavily relies on mathematics to describe fundamental forces, particles, and cosmic phenomena, for example. Without mathematical equations like Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism or Einstein's equations of general relativity, much of modern science will not be possible. Therefore, the conclusion logically follows. We ought to have ontological commitment to mathematical entities. So how does Quine or Putnam support their argument? They use two key ideas, namely the philosophies of naturalism and confirmational holism. Naturalism is a philosophical viewpoint that asserts that everything arises from natural properties and causes and supernatural or, or metaphysical explanations are excluded or wholly discounted. In other words, naturalism is the opposite of supernaturalism. Naturalism rules out non-scientific ways of determining existence. For Quine, there isn't a separate philosophical method to decide what exists. Instead, we should rely on our best scientific theories. If science commits us to certain entities like electrons or mathematical objects, so be it. We should accept these as real. In other words, we should accept anything as real and true if science proved it to be true. So if there's a successful scientific theory out there that uses mathematics, then the mathematics used must also be true. Similarly, if there's a successful scientific theory that uses astrology, for example, then the astrology used must be true as well, despite astrology's mystical origins. Confirmational holism supports this by arguing that scientific theories are tested as a whole. In other words, if a theory, including its mathematical components, is confirmed by experiments, we should accept all aspects of that theory, like all of it. If you accept one part of the theory, then you accept all of it. If you don't accept one part of it, then you don't accept the theory. So if you accept the scientific theory as being true and that theory uses mathematics, then you accept the mathematics as true as well. In short, naturalism justifies using science to determine existence and holism supports accepting all parts of a successful scientific theory, including its mathematics. To wrap up, the Quine-Putnam indispensability argument suggests that if mathematics is essential to our best scientific theories, we ought to believe in the existence of mathematical entities. This pushes us to consider mathematical objects like numbers and functions as more than just useful tools. They might actually exist in some form or another, somewhere, even if they're abstract. And while the Quine-Putnam argument obviously strengthens the case for mathematical realism, the debate over the ontology of mathematical objects is far from settled. There are quite a few objections to mathematical realism, such as the mathematical philosophies of fictionalism and intuitionism. And there are a few objections to the, ind to the indispensability argument, even among other mathematical realists. Maybe I'll discuss that in another video. Until then, let me know what you thought about this video in the comments section below. 
and let me know if you'd like to see other videos pertaining to the philosophy of mathematics. Thanks for watching. Take care.